Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Windsor. In this lecture, I will cover patient monitoring and local and regional anesthesia. Uh, the content of this lecture does correspond with chapter 14 in the Pharmacology for Surgical Technologists 5th edition that's co-authored by Howe and Burton. As the surgical technologist, it's really important for us to be aware of the various types of monitoring and the components of those monitoring devices, as well as understand the purpose of each of those. A heightened awareness of the patient's well-being is going to equip us with the knowledge necessary to support the anesthesia care provider and the patient when needed. Remember, we are the extra eyes and ears for our patients and our surgical team members. So as the title of this chapter suggests, we will be learning about the aspects of patient monitoring in the operating room. By the end, you should have a better understanding of the terms and abbreviations associated with patient monitoring and anesthesia, as well as the different devices that are used to monitor the patient. We'll also learn about monitored anesthesia care. In the second half of the lecture, I'll discuss concepts related to local and regional anesthesia. By the end, you should be able to discuss the applications, common agents used, and safety considerations. Lastly, you should gain a better understanding of the different types of regional blocks. So the surgical technologist is witness to the administration of anesthesia in the operating room nearly every day, and in some cases, multiple times in one day. As such, understanding patient monitoring and local and regional anesthesia will ensure that we provide the highest quality of patient care. I want to start our discussion by reviewing some of the key terms that you will hear throughout this lecture. First on the list is auscultation. Auscultation is a non-invasive measure that is used to assess the patient's heart and lungs. If you've ever been to the doctor and they said, let me listen to your heart and let me take a few deep breaths, they're using their little stethoscope, that is auscultation. We also monitor the patient's blood pressure throughout their time in the operating room. Remember, blood pressure is a measure of the force of the blood against the vessel wall, and a blood pressure cuff is used to monitor the patient's blood pressure. We've probably all had our blood pressure taken as well. Lastly, um, capnometry is a measure of how much carbon dioxide the patient is exhaling. We'll talk a little bit more about each of these as we go through. So three additional terms that we should be familiar with are electrocardiography, epidural, and exsanguination. Electrocardiography, or ECG, is the process of monitoring the patient's heart rate and heart rhythm. It does this by recording the electrical activity of the heart. Epidural is a term that is used in conjunction with anesthesia, and it's generally used to refer to the injection of an anesthetic agent into the space surrounding the dura mater, so outside of the dura. Exsanguination, uh, with its root sanguine, which means blood, means to render bloodless. And when using a tourniquet, the limb is often exsanguinated with an S-marked bandage, and the limb is going to be wrapped tightly with the bandage starting at the most distal portion of the limb and working proximally to remove a significant amount of blood from the tissues. The term intrathecally is used when we refer to the spinal canal uh, or spinal anesthesia. So intrathecal refers to the administration of local anesthetic within the spinal canal. Local anesthesia 
is the administration of an anesthetic agent to nerve endings uh, directly at the surgical site. So it's common for the surgeon to inject local anesthetic at the surgical site prior to incision, and then he or she may inject that same site multiple times throughout or at least at the end as well. Monitored anesthesia care is often abbreviated as MAC, and a lot of times we refer to it as MAC. MAC is defined by the, by the um, American Society of Anesthesiologists, and it does include varying levels of sedation, analgesia, and anxiolysis as needed. Uh, the anesthesia provider is going to monitor all, monitor all of the vital signs continuously during these procedures. And patients that have surgery under local MAC, which is a MAC with local anesthetic, are typically not intubated. Instead, they're put into kind of like this twilight sleep. Maybe it's similar to when we're sleeping at night where we might sleep for a while and then we might wake up a little bit. Patients will typically have a little bit of awareness during surgery, and because of that, we need to be even more mindful of what we are saying and how we are saying it and the noise level in the room and those kinds of things. Uh, the last two terms that I want to review are pulse oximetry and regional anesthesia. Pulse oximetry is one of the most common physiological functions monitored in surgical patients. Now, the pulse ox measures the level of oxygen saturation that is in the patient's blood. It also has the ability to measure the patient's heart rate. Regional anesthesia is administered to a group of nerves, and oftentimes we refer to these groups as a plexus. And regional anesthesia is a method of anesthesia in which an agent is injected to block pain impulses at that nerve plexus. It is important to note that regional anesthesia causes both sensory and motor block. So not only will the patient not be able to feel anything, they're not going to be able to move their limb either. So when the patient arrives in the operating room, several monitoring devices are gonna be attached to them. And this can be really overwhelming and scary for the patient because they have multiple unknown faces coming at them from every direction to put on the EKG leads, to put on the oxygen mask, to put on the pulse ox, to put on the blood pressure cuff, all of these things. It's cold, it's just weird uh, in there. So. While we typically do not place the monitor uh, monitors on the patient, it is well within our scope. So it isn't a far stretch to say that you might be the one helping to put these monitors on the patient. So it's a best practice to always let the patient know what you are going to do and what you're placing on them and why. And this is just another reason why it's so important for us to be able to define, explain the purpose of, and provide details about patient monitoring devices. So as I mentioned before, the patient is constantly monitored during surgery. Constant monitoring is going to provide the surgical team with some real-time feedback about how the patient is doing, what their physiological status is, and is there any change to that status. Um, physiological functions are monitored via direct observation as well as these monitoring devices. And if you have your textbook next to you, you can take a look at box 14.1 for a list of the most common physiological functions that are monitored in the surgical patient. Uh, I'm also going to list them for you right now. They include ECG, pulse oximetry, blood pressure, temperature, capnometry, and neuromuscular function. 
It's also important to note that certain circumstances might require advanced or invasive monitoring methods to evaluate things like arterial pressure or central venous pressure or pulmonary artery pressure. So we will discuss each of these in a bit more detail. So first up, electrocardiography. Uh, you'll recall that electrocardiography provides continuous assessment of the patient's heart rate and the heart rhythm. So the electrocardiogram or ECG is a way to record the heart's electrical activity. The ECG is supplemented by auscultation. Remember that's listening to the sounds of the chest with a stethoscope. Now the ECG may be recorded with a three or five lead system. And uh, in the OR, it's been my experience that we use a three lead system. Uh, so when the patient comes into the OR, leads are going to be attached to the patient. There's these little stickies and you put the stickies on and then attach the electrodes to those little uh, sticky stickies. Uh, so in this image here on your screen, you can see how the three lead system is applied. And the leads are color coded. So one is white, one is black, and one is red. And you can see those three here on this image as well. And one easy way to remember how they are placed is to remember white on the right and smoke over fire. So white on the right means the white lead is going to be placed on the patient's right side just below the clavicle. And then the black lead is going to be placed on the patient's left side just below the clavicle. And then the red lead is going to also be placed on the patient's left, but it goes below the black one. So that's where the smoke over fire comes. So white on the right, smoke over fire. Prior to placement, you want to make sure that the skin is clean and dry and there aren't any breaks in the skin before you go putting some sort of adhesive sticker onto the skin. Uh, after the leads are placed, the electrical activity of the heart is going to be recorded and then it's going to be displayed on a monitor. There may also be a printout of the activity and you're going to hear the monitor making a beeping sound, which is going to indicate the patient's heart rate. So let's talk about the pulse oximetry. Um, pulse oximetry is a non-invasive way to measure the patient's blood oxygen saturation. So how much oxygen is in the blood? A lot of times we call this the pulse ox for short. So you might hear it called that. Uh, the saturation level is going to be displayed as a percentage on the monitor. And the percentage is going to provide the surgical team with an assessment of the patient's respiratory function. The procedure involves using a two-sided sensor probe, and that can be placed on the finger, the toe, or the earlobe. Uh, sometimes we call it the ET finger. Um, but the concept of the pulse oximetry kind of seems simple, but it actually involves uh, a fair amount of detail. So inside that little probe, there is a red infrared light, and that gets absorbed when it passes through the tissue, and the remaining light that's detected by the opposite side of the sensor is what gets calculated into the saturation of peripheral oxygen. So on the monitor, you might see some little letters and numbers that say SpO2. So that's saturation of peripheral oxygen. So the ideal level of saturation is 95% and above, uh, 100 being uh, the highest. Uh, there's also going to be an audible signal for the pulse rate. Um, the uh, there could be varied tones as well. So if the tone is getting deeper, uh, uh, then that could mean that the saturation is declining. It's getting lower. Um, there are also other factors that could uh, hinder the uh, an adequate reading. 
uh, intravenous dyes can potentially affect the reading, nail polish used to affect the reading. Um, but however, today most of the devices are capable of adjusting to any of those situations. A third means of monitoring the surgical patient is blood pressure. So blood pressure, like I said, is a measure of the force of blood against the vessel wall. And the purpose of monitoring the patient's blood pressure is to assess their cardiovascular status. And we wanna make sure that we use a cuff that is the appropriate size, right? Uh, patients are come in all different shapes and sizes. So the cuff should be approximately one and a half times the circumference of the patient's upper arm. Now, normal blood pressure is approximately 120 over 80. Uh, normal blood pressure for most adults, um, you know, does fall within, in, within that, uh, within a range. That range is kind of starting to change. Um, but like the pulse ox, uh, it can be impacted by a number of factors. And some of those factors include ventricular contraction strength, capillary resistance, vessel wall elasticity, and blood volume. Now in surgery, blood pressure is going to be monitored electronically as opposed to manually. So the machine is going to do our work for us. Uh, if the blood pressure is not within the monitor's preset limits, then there is going to be an alarm that alerts us to that. So the patient's temperature is also going to be monitored when they're in the operating room. And the, the measurement of the temperature is important because all patients under general anesthesia are at risk of mild to significant hypothermia. Remember, that means being too cold. So uh, a baseline measure is taken and any changes are going to be monitored and documented. Now, those that are at a high risk for hypothermia are the youngest patients and the oldest patients. And the temperature can be monitored from several locations and those include the skin, axilla, bladder, esophagus, and the ear. Simple monitoring strips can also be placed on the patient's forehead for basic monitoring of the temperature. However, a lower esophageal probe is gonna offer the most accurate reading of the patient's core body temperature with the least risk of injury to the patient. Normal body temperature is typically 98 degrees Fahrenheit, or 37 degrees Celsius. Now, if we have a core temperature that falls below 36 degrees Celsius, we are starting to worry about hypothermia. Hypothermia alters many of the body's functions and it's also gonna increase the risk of surgical site infection. So this is why we take measures to minimize heat loss, such as using forced air warmers, warm blankets, and even warm irrigation. Capno uh, capnography or capnometry, I guess, um, measures the carbon dioxide that is exhaled by the patient, and we call that intidal CO2. So this is going to help the surgical team uh, uh, also assess respiratory function. It can also serve a critical role in the early detection of conditions such as a com compromised ventilation or malignant hyperthermia. So there is a tubing that extends from an adapter on the ventilator tubing to the respiratory analyzer. And the measure of expired carbon dioxide is going to appear in graphic and numeric forms. You can see it circled in this image at the top right of your screen here. The machine is also programmed to alarm if the CO2 levels exceed preset levels. So a modified EEG is another patient monitoring device. 
this device is going to help determine the patient's level of consciousness. Patient awareness while under anesthesia is rare. Uh, approximately one to two out of a thousand patients, but it's still a significant concern. EEG data are obtained from a sensor that is placed on the patient's forehead and it's going to be displayed on a monitor. And that's the one that you see here. Uh, it's a bispectral index monitor, and we call that a biz monitor for short. So the readings on the biz are between 0 and 100, and this is going to tell us the patient's level of unconsciousness. Um, if there is a reading that is near 100, then that means that the patient's fully awake. Um, a reading of zero is going to indicate the total absence of brain activity. Uh, and then biz values between 40 and 60 represent adequate general anesthesia, but anything below 40 is going to tell us that the patient is in a deep hypnotic state. Uh, so like I said, in this image of the biz monitor, uh, you can see the patient's level of consciousness is a five. So during general anesthesia, muscle relaxants are going to be given to allow for endotracheal intubation. Something called a nerve stimulator can help assess the neuromuscular function as well as the extent of relaxation. So um, a surface electrode or probe is going to deliver a stimulus or an electrical impulse really. Uh, it's typically placed at the ulnar nerve or a branch of the facial nerve. And in my experience, the stimulus is delivered to the like the temple area of the head. And it's going to deliver four stimuli. They also say train of four, T-O-F. And if there are four twitches that are observed, one from each of the stimuli, then that means there's no muscle relaxation whatsoever. On the other hand, if there's no twitch response observed, that is going to indicate complete muscle relaxation. So now that we have a better understanding of some of the non-invasive monitoring techniques, let's review a few more advanced monitoring strategies. In select patients, more invasive monitoring techniques may be indicated. These can include arterial catheterization and pressure monitoring, central venous catheterization and pressure monitoring, and pulmonary artery catheterization. And one example of a pulmonary artery catheter is a swan catheter. Now, arterial pressure monitoring catheters, a lot of times we call them art lines, are usually placed in the radial artery, and then they are connected to a transducer that's going to record arterial pressure. This is going to give us a highly accurate measurement of the blood pressure. Um, the insertion of the art line is typically indicated when there is a potential for rapid changes in blood pressure, frequent sampling of arterial blood for blood gas analysis, or when routine blood pressure management is uh, or measurement, excuse me, blood pressure measurement is inaccurate. So similarly, central venous pressure monitoring catheters or CVP lines are also sometimes indicated. Uh, the CVP line is placed in the superior vena cava and it's used to assess the volume of blood that's returning to the heart. It's also used to assess the need for fluid replacement and or to prevent fluid overload. The pulmonary artery catheter or PA catheter, like a swan catheter, uh, is guided through the heart into a branch of the pulmonary artery to measure central venous pressure 
pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and cardiac output. Patients that are having cardiac surgery or lung or liver transplantation are those that typically will receive a PA catheter. Transesophageal echocardiography, or TEE, is a type of advanced monitoring. It's non-invasive, and it uses sonography to assess cardiac function, and it's often used during heart surgery. So what they're going to do is they're going to insert a probe into the esophagus, and sound waves are used to obtain an image of the heart. This type of monitoring is going to provide information about the motion of the cardiac wall, heart valve function, intravascular fluid volume, and whether air is present in the heart or not. These more advanced monitoring devices may be placed before or after the administration of general anesthesia, but we want to we don't want to stress out the patient or torture the patient any more than we have to. So if these types of invasive um, procedures have to be done and we can do them after they have been anesthetized, uh, that is the most humane thing to do. So now that we've completed our discussion regarding monitoring devices, we're gonna shift gears and learn more about sedation and monitored anesthesia care. Monitored anesthesia care, or MAC, like I mentioned earlier, refers to the pre-op, intra-op, and post-op anesthesia care. So soup to nuts anesthesia care. MAC is utilized for diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, it might include varying levels of sedation, analgesia, and anxiolysis. The anesthesia care provider continuously monitors all vital signs, including the patient's heart rate, an ECG, blood pressure, respirations, and oxygen saturation during these procedures. Uh, patient sedation may range from minimal to moderate to deep. So the anesthesia care provider is going to take into consideration the patient's clinical condition or the potential need to convert to a general or regional anesthetic when determining if a MAC is the best course of action. Colonoscopies and EGDs are commonly performed under MAC. Agents that may be given during a MAC include midazolam, fentanyl, alfentanil, liperidine, and propofol. So the goal of anesthesia is to interrupt the transmission of sensation of pain through nerve impulses. So this can be accomplished at the nerve endings, at groups of nerves, or even at the level of the brain. Now local anesthesia, as this slide shows, is injected at the surgical site or applied topically. Local anesthesia is going to block pain at the nerve endings in the immediate surgical site. In the event that local anesthesia will be administered without an anesthesia care provider, uh, a nurse other than the circulating nurse must be present to monitor the patient's vitals during the procedure. Only physically healthy and psychologically stable patients are appropriate candidates for local anesthesia without monitoring by an anesthesia care provider. So local anesthesia has several applications. It might be used, like I said, with or without sedation. In general surgery, local injections are appropriate for excision or biopsy of like small soft tissue masses, like in a breast biopsy, 
Um, other procedures might include pacemaker insertion, uh, venous access port or catheter placement, the insertion of a dialysis access graft, uh, and cataract removal surgery. Uh, it might also be used in plastic surgery for procedures like excision of small lesions or maybe minor scar revisions. There are also orthopedic applications and applications for head and neck surgery and urology. To mescent anesthesia, so here I want to draw your attention to the picture on the top left. Uh, is often used prior to liposuction, and that's what they're doing in the bottom left image. This involves injecting a large volume of solution, and it is a combination of normal saline, lidocaine, epi, and sodium bicarbonate. And the sodium bicarbonate is going to help to increase the absorption rate. To mess in anesthesia, facilitates the fat suctioning, uh, provides local anesthesia, and also reduces blood loss during liposuction. Sometimes glucocorticoids are gonna be added to the tumescent to reduce inflammation and potential scarring that could follow. So there are a lot of different agents that are used for local anesthesia and the duration of action of local anesthetics varies a lot due to the differences in their plasma protein binding capacity and their individual lipid binding affinity, right? They fall under one of two categories, which include amino esters and amino amides. And uh, we're going to learn about the amino esters first. So some examples of amino esters include topical cocaine, benzocaine, and tetracaine. Now, um, there's also injectable procaine, which is novocaine. So if you've been to the dentist, chances are you've probably been injected with novocaine. Uh, benzocaine is strictly topical, and then tetracaine is considered a local anesthetic, and it's a long-acting one. Topical cocaine and injectable procaine were two of the first local anesthetic agents and both are classified as amino esters. Uh, cocaine is made from the coca leaves and it's sometimes used in nasal surgery to anesthetize the mucous membranes of the nose. It comes in a liquid solution of 4% and 10%. Uh, however, concentrations over 4% do increase the risk of toxic reactions. Typically, we will soak cottonoids in the cocaine and the surgeon uses them to pack the nose. Um, you know, when we do rhinoplasties is a good example. I would set up a separate mayo stand with a bayonet forceps, the med cup, the nurse would pour the cocaine in there, the cottonoids would be there. It's like a separate little um, station that's not sterile and the surgeon will go ahead and pack the nose and then right before we start surgery the surgeon would remove those cottonoids um, but they're not using it as much as they used to today there are some better alternatives such as lidocaine or phenylephrine um, and oxymetazoline which we can use in combination to anesthetize and shrink the mucous membranes in place of the topical cocaine. Benzocaine, like I said, is a topical amino ester anesthetic and it has a really rapid onset and a duration of about 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, it's a lot of times used prior to bronchoscopy or if they have to do like a difficult intubation where they're gonna use the fiber optic scope. Tetracaine uh, is also identified or classified as an amino ester, and it is a potent, long-lasting local anesthetic that a lot of times is administered prior to cataract surgery. It might also be used in spinal anesthesia, uh, and we'll talk more about that later. But tetracaine has a rapid onset, 
and a duration of about 90 to 120 minutes. So as I mentioned previously, amino amides are another category of local anesthetic. And some examples of those include lidocaine, bupivacaine, ropivacaine, and mopivacaine. Amino amides that are the most common uh, in surgery are lidocaine, bupivacaine, and ropivacaine. Mepivacaine uh, is used less frequently than the others, and lidocaine and bupivacaine are commonly combined with dilute epinephrine. Remember, epi is a vasoconstrictor, and because of that, it slows the absorption of the local anesthetic into the bloodstream, and so it keeps it at the surgical site longer. Local anesthetics without epi uh, may have a blue band on them, and you can see each of these uh, images that I have, they're all blue. Um, if they have epi, they're going to have a red label to signify that there's epi. Lidocaine is by far the most common local anesthetic agent used today. It's fast acting and it's rapidly metabolized by the body. Its duration without epi is about uh, 30 to 60 minutes, but with epi, uh, it's about two to three hours. So it's available for injection uh, in some different concentrations, which include 0.5%, 1%, 1.5%, and 2%. It also comes in a 2% jelly, which can be used for topical urethral application prior to cystoscopy. Bupivacaine is four times more potent than lidocaine, and it comes in 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.75 with or without epi. And because it is more highly bound and lipid soluble, it has a longer duration than lidocaine, which is about three to seven hours. Interestingly, epinephrine is not going to prolong the duration of bupivacaine, but it does limit vascular uptake. Uh, it can be used to block nerves after like a hernia repair or port site, uh, at the port sites following laparoscopic surgery. Bupivacaine also binds to cardiac muscle, so uh, as a result, cardiotoxicity can occur. Uh, it's definitely contraindicated in IV regional anesthesia because of toxicity. Um, ropivacaine was approved for use in 1996, and it's really similar to bupivacaine, but the good news is it's less cardiotoxic. So it's available in concentrations of 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1%. Uh, it's also packaged in ampules of 10, 20, and 30 mLs, and they can be popped right up onto the field, and they can be drawn up by the surge tech sterile, which is kind of cool. And then lastly, mepivacaine uh, is really similar in potency and duration to lidocaine. It's available in a variety of concentrations too. Uh, it comes in 1%. 1.5%, 2%, and 3%. Uh, it is used less often because it really doesn't have any significant advantages over lidocaine. Adverse reactions to amino amide local anesthetics are usually dose-related. Uh, adverse effects can include unconsciousness, uh, respiratory arrest, nausea, vomiting, visual disturbances, tingling, slurred speech, excitability, hypotension, bradycardia, ventricular arrhythmia, and in some really severe cases, cardiac arrest. Systemic toxicity of local anesthetics is most commonly due to inadvertent intravascular injection during peripheral nerve inf infiltration. So this means that instead of bathing the nerve with the anesthetic, it gets accidentally injected into a vessel.
So as I mentioned previously, when combined with a local anesthetic agent, epinephrine causes local vasoconstriction. This means that it's going to keep the agent from absorbing quickly into the circulatory system, and this is going to keep the local anesthetic in the surgical site longer, and it's going to increase the duration of effect. Epinephrine uh, comes with a very strong caution. When pre-mixed in a local anesthetic agent, it's present uh, in very, very low amounts, but it's also available separately in very high concentrations, like the 1 to 1,000. Um, it's crucial to administer epi in the correct concentration for the correct purpose and by the correct route. And if you've joined me for other discussions regarding epinephrine, you will know that if these concepts are not understood and followed. Death can occur, and it has occurred in the past. Uh, epi that's available in high concentrations is for topical use only. This means that we should never draw it up into a syringe. Um, it's best to put it in some sort of shallow type dish. Uh, as the ST, we must take extreme caution to make sure that we handle each and every medication with the utmost care and consideration because our patients' lives literally depend on it. Regional anesthesia is a little bit different than local anesthesia. Regional anesthesia blocks nerves or groups of nerves called a plexus and not just the nerve endings like local anesthesia. As a result, it's going to anesthetize a larger area than local anesthetic does. Regional blocks can also affect sympathetic, sensory, and motor nerve supply. So for this reason, the limb may not be uh, mobile, right? So the limb, they might not be able to use it, and they're also not going to be able to feel anything. Uh, patients with regional blocks do need to be monitored at all times by the anesthesia care provider. So local and regional anesthesia are similar in that they use the same agents and monitor the same vital signs and the patient is awake. These anesthesia methods, they also have differences. Uh, for example, local anesthesia is administered by the surgeon and renal anesthesia, regional anesthesia is given by the anesthesia care provider. They also have different surgical applications. In uh, local, the surgeon is going to administer the anesthesia, right, and then the Anesthesia care provider may be present, uh, if it's a local MAC, to monitor the patients and provide additional medications as needed. With the regional um, anesthesia, the anesthesia care provider is going to administer the block and then they're going to remain to monitor the patient's vital signs. So local and regional have uh, also have different administration routes. And then regional is used when both sentry and motor block is necessary for a surgical procedure. So the various types of regional anesthetic techniques are usually named for the nerves of areas of the body to be blocked. Almost any group of nerves can be blocked. However, in this lecture, we're only going to cover the most frequently used regional anesthetic blocks, which are spinal and epidural. And another name for these is central neuraxial blockade. So first I wanna talk about spinal anesthesia. For spinal anesthesia, medications are injected through the dura into the subarachnoid space and cerebrospinal fluid in the lumbar area at about L3, L4, 
of the spine near the end of the spinal cord. This is referred to as the intrafecal route, and this is going to anesthetize the entire lower body. Typically, the circulating nurse is going to be the one to assist the anesthesia care provider by helping the patient get into the right position and stay still and, um, you know, assist the anesthesia care provider in whatever other way they need. Uh, the patient may lay on their side with their knees bent or they may sit with their legs off the side of the OR table. Uh, after the skin is prepped by the anesthesia care provider, the, the spinal um, stuff usually comes in a kit. Um, so the skin will be prepped and then there's a little drape with a hole in it. We call that a, fenestr a fenestration. So a fenestrated sterile drape is going to be placed in the area and then the some local anesthetic is going to be injected to kind of numb up the area a little bit. Then the anesthesia care provider is going to insert the spinal needle. And in this bottom image on the right, you can see that spinal needle is inserted. Um, now, the anesthesia care provider is going to know that the needle's in the right place because they're gonna get back uh, some cerebral spinal fluid. And once they get that drop of cerebral spinal fluid, then they're going to attach the syringe like you see in their hand there and go ahead and inject the medication and then the needle is going to be completely withdrawn so nothing stays in the patient's back at all. Tetracaine, bupivacaine, and ropivacaine are common agents that are used for spinal anesthesia. And to test the efficacy of the spinal anesthesia, the anesthesia care provider may take like a, a clean hypodermic needle and just kind of lightly poke from, you know, lower abdomen kind of going up towards the rib cage um, and get some feedback from the patient on whether they can feel sensation or not. Uh, in my experience, uh, I've also seen the surgeon like use a forceps before we start surgery to kind of pinch the patient wherever we're going to make the incision um, to assess sensation as well. So uh, the goal is that the patient can't feel anything. Uh, spinal anesthetic is typically used for procedures of the lower abdomen like C-section. So commonly we do spinals for C-sections. Um, or surgeries of the perineum like vaginal hyster uh, hysterectomy or transurethral resection of the prostate or uh, transurethral resection of the bladder tumor. Um, we also use it for lower extremity surgeries like total hip and total knee replacements. Um, uh, the spinal can cause a drop in blood pressure and this is due to vasodilation. Uh, so that's something that we want to look for. Uh, and then lastly, uh, about spinal anesthesia, intrathecal catheters and pumps are sometimes used to provide pain relief to patients that suffer from various types of chronic pain. So let's talk about the epidural. Uh, in epidural anesthesia, the medication is injected into the space surrounding the dura. So now we're outside of the dura, whereas the spinal is inside the dura. Uh, so an epidural uh, could consist of a single injection or a catheter may be inserted so that the anesthesia care provider can add additional medication uh, as necessary. The prepping and the, the positioning and the draping uh, are all the same uh, for the epidural as they are for the spinal. So after the local anesthetic is injected, then that epidural needle is going to be placed and the epidural is commonly used to relieve the pain associated with childbirth. 
Um, bupivacaine is most commonly used for obstetric epidural anesthesia. And in obstetric anesthesia, concentrations of 0.125 plus very low doses of fentanyl are used to provide something called a walking epidural. So in some instances, epidurals are preferred over spinal anesthesia. And this is when the surgical procedure duration is variable or it's going to be prolonged uh, or they will require longer post-operative analgesia. Uh, there are also some advantages over spinal anesthesia. First, the epidural anesthesia has less of a risk of hypotension. Uh, and secondly, epidural anesthesia has less incidence of postdural puncture headache. Um, I, the one and only time that I had a spinal anesthetic, I ended up with a tear in my dura, which caused a CSF to leak out, which causes a very terrible headache. Uh, postdural puncture headache, or sometimes they call it spinal headache, uh, it was very painful and annoying. Uh, and also, epidural anesthesia may be administered at levels above that L3, L4, unlike spinal anesthesia. So caudal anesthesia is a type of epidural block that's injected into the epidural space via the sacral canal. So hopefully you can see that on this image here. Um, they also used to be, well, sometimes they're used in combination with a general anesthetic for like lower extremity procedures in children. Um, but they might also be used to manage post-op pain in some patients. Caudal blocks uh, used for vaginal childbirth are pretty rare these days um, because we have, uh, you know, the, the preferred method is the lumbar epidural that we talked about already. So we're gonna finish up our discussion regarding regional anesthesia with a discussion about peripheral nerve block, intravenous regional anesthesia, and retrobulbar block. So let's start with peripheral nerve block. Peripheral nerve block, we abbreviate PNB, uh, but it might also be called an extremity block. And these may be used for procedures of the distal arms, legs, hands, feet, fingers, toes, all right? So peripheral nerve blocks are more commonly used for procedures of the upper extremities, whereas for most surgical procedures on the lower extremities, uh, we're gonna use a spinal or an epidural rather than the use of several nerve blocks to achieve something that one block can achieve. Um, the arm may be blocked at the brachial plexus, median, radial, or ulnar nerves. Uh, blocks of the lower extremities can occur at the femoral, obturator, or sciatic nerves. And hopefully you can see some of that anatomy on your screen here. So peripheral nerve blocks are often administered in the pre-op holding area prior to surgery. And uh, to prepare for the extremity block, the anesthesia care provider is going to need to pre-medicate the patient with some anxiolytics and analgesics so that they are more comfortable and less nervous. Uh, it's extremely important that the anesthesia care provider pinpoints exactly where the location of the nerve is so that they avoid penetrating the nerve sheath, that they don't damage any nearby vessels, and they don't accidentally inject the medication into a vessel. Oftentimes, the anesthesia care provider will use ultrasound technology so that they can identify that nerve and they know where to put their needle. Um, 
after the needle is placed, then a test dose is going to be administered. And then after that, the patient's going to get several small doses of the agent until the intended dose is complete. Uh, if you take a look at figure 14.13 in your textbook, you'll see the location of axillary block injection. Uh, this is the most common approach according to the text for a brachial plexus block. Uh, the image on your screen shows a brachial plexus block using a supraclavicular approach. Uh, a brachial plexus block is going to be used for procedures on the hand, forearm, or elbow. The primary disadvantage of peripheral nerve blocks is that it takes time uh, not only to do them, but for them to take effect. So because of that, uh, if, if it's not straightforward, uh, our surgery can be delayed. And as I previously mentioned, peripheral nerve blocks are often administered in the pre-op holding area. However, there's some, there are some institutions that have a separate block room where the anesthetic agent is administered and then the block is allowed time to fully take effect before the patient is transported to the operating room. Unfortunately, it is somewhat difficult to get that timing of the block aligned with the availability of the operating room. The most common uh, intravenous regional anesthesia, or IVRA, is called a beer block. Uh, and in your text, figure 14.14, uh, shows you an intravenous regional block. The equipment that we're going to need for a beer block includes a double tourniquet and an S-mark bandage. Uh, the beer blocks are frequently used for procedures of the hand and the wrist, and they are administered by the anesthesia care provider in the OR suite. Uh, first, the patient is gonna have uh, another IV inserted in the operative uh, extremity, like you can see here on this bottom image. Uh, then they're going to um, pad the upper extremity with some gauze, uh, and then they're going to place a double tourniquet uh, on there. Uh, then they're going to exsanguinate the extremity with a S mark, that's that blue thing that you see uh, in the top image, uh, and then the tourniquet's gonna be inflated, and then they're going to inject the medication, and that is going to numb up uh, the area where we're gonna be working. Uh, lidocaine is the most common anesthetic agent used for a beer block. Bupivacaine uh, is contraindicated for intravenous regional anesthesia because toxicity is associated with intramuscular administration. Another contraindication uh, to intravenous regional anesthesia is traumatic laceration. Uh, if the patient has one of these, it could allow uncontrolled release of the agent from the limb. Uh, and so once the procedure is over, then the tourniquet's going to be deflated slowly so that that regional anesthetic does not kind of, you know, hit the vascular system all at once. Um, the most significant risk with intravenous regional anesthesia uh, is tourniquet failure. Uh, this could cause a toxic volume, like I said, of anesthetic uh, to rapidly enter the systemic circulation. Uh, the last concept on our list to discuss is retrobulbar block. A retrobulbar block is injected behind the eye into the muscle cone to block branches of the oculomotor nerve. And you can see uh, on the image here the kind of different trajectory of the retrobulbar versus the peribulbar block. Um, the block can either be administered by the anesthesia care provider or the surgeon. And retrobulbar blocks are typically used when the surgeon requires the eye to be completely motionless 
the uh, medication is going to be equal parts of lidocaine and bupivacaine. Uh, and sometimes they'll throw in some hyaluronidase to help with infiltration. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, a similar technique called the, the peribulbar block is going to involve injection of the anesthetic outside of the muscle cone to avoid the optic nerve, but it requires more anesthetic agent and it does have a slower onset of action. So this is going to wrap up this lecture on patient monitoring and local and regional anesthesia. Uh, there are some things to remember with all types of an anesthesia. Using varied methods, um, all surgical patients under anesthesia need to be closely monitored. Uh, the surgical technologist's value as a surgical team member is increased with an understanding of how the patient is monitored and by a basic knowledge of anesthetic agents. Particular attention must be given to the use of epinephrine, right? Um, so thank you so much for your time and your devotion to the field of surgical technology and patient care. See you next time. Take care.